screen. All right, good evening. Welcome to another lecture given by the IDMR youth. First of all, this is a school and not a church. Neither we associated with any religious organizations, Jehovah Witnesses, or any other denominations that you have taught in the world today. This school was founded in the year of 1931 by Dr. Henry C. Kimley, who was given a divine vision and revelation direct from Yahweh. And the charts you see here pictorially illustrated before you are the results of that divine vision and revelation. We have branch schools operating throughout the United States and in various parts of the world. I will be explaining the names that you see here. Yahweh is a true and correct original name of our Heavenly Father, which was once laid down in the scriptures. We have Yahweh symbolizes a cloud on this chart because Yahweh symbolizes himself as a cloud in many passages of your Bible. We have the cloud extended all around the edges of the chart so that everything on the chart is within the cloud, just as everything that exists exists within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. And in this pure spirit state, Yahweh has no particular shape or form in which he is the ultimate source and substance, limit and bounds of everything that exists. Now, we have translators to come across the true and correct name of our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. They have usually inserted the English title, Lord. Yahweh taken on super incorporeal shape and form within himself known as Elohim. Now, super incorporeal means without physical flesh and blood. And in this state, Yahweh Elohim can only be seen through divine vision and revelation, as stated in Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the Elohim of Israel. Now, remember, they saw Elohim in the divine vision and revelation. Now, when your translators have come across the true and correct title for Yahweh in shape and form known as Elohim, they have usually inserted the English title, God. Yahweh Elohim, now manifested in a physical body as the Savior of the world, is known as Yahshua the Messiah, and saved in John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. And in the 14th verse, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when our translators have come across the true and correct name of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, they have usually inserted the English, the false and erroneous name, such as Jesus Christ. But remember, Yahweh in his pure spirit state as the Father, Yahweh taking on super incorporeal shape within himself as the word of Son, is known as Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim manifested in a physical body as the Savior of the world, is known as Yahshua the Messiah. Yahweh and his two manifestations, but one spirit, as stated in 1 John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. A minor investigation on your part will prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that the name and title that we teach here are true and correct, but that the names and titles that you have taught in the world today are false and erroneous. For example, look up the letter J. It is not and never has been in any part of the Hebrew language and did not come into existence into any language prior to the Middle Ages. Therefore, such names as Jehovah and Jesus are impossible renderings of our Heavenly Father's true and correct name, Yahweh, and his son, Yahshua the Messiah. We will have our aim by Dr. Sean Carter. The primary constitutional objectives of the Institute are as follows. One. To help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, sex, creed, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so called law of nature and the powers laid in man. Four, to encourage and promote the studies of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and the ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. 
9, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. 10, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in a newer state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is to speak the truth. All right, we're going to have prayer by Dr. Amir Coleman. Amir. May we bow our hearts and minds. Dear Heavenly Father Yahweh, through your son Yahshua, we want to thank you for allowing us to know your name and to have a knowledge and understanding of your purpose, pattern, and plan. And we ask that you continue in, to lead us and guide us in righteousness according to your will that you have already preordained and to be steadfast in the gospel and not weary and to continue to build us and, and, and make us still so that we can see through the chaos in the time that we're in now. And to bring back the things unto our remembrance, the things that you've shown us, the things that you got us through, the things that you have overcome through us, for us. And remember the, 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 the battles that you have won for us, the times that you have taken care of us. And, 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 and... hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Dr. Okay, um... The scripture lesson will be Genesis, the first chapter. I don't know what's going on with this little thing. Amber, are you able to read the scripture lesson? Yes. All right. All right so I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trainer, the Scripture Research Association Incorporated. Genesis first chapter. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and the earth became without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim divided between the light and between the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And Elohim said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And Elohim called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And Elohim said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And Elohim called the dry portion earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, let the earth bring forth tender grass, the earth yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth tender grass, herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And Elohim said, let the lights in the firmament of the heavens separate the day from the night, and they will be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And Elohim made to appear two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heaven to lighten the earth and to rule by day and by night and to separate between light and between darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And Elohim said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and birds that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. And Elohim created great sea monsters and every living creature that swarms with which the waters swarm 
after their kind, and every winged bird after his kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and increase, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. And Elohim made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the ground after their kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So Elohim created man in his image, and the image of Elohim created he him. Male and female created he him. And Elohim blessed him. And Elohim said unto him, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Ugh, sorry. And subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth in every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to every creeping thing upon the earth wherein there is life i have given every green herb for food and it was so and elohim saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts and on the seventh day, Elohim completed his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which Elohim created in man. Genesis first chapter. Very good. Um, if you had the King James Version of the Bible, that was Genesis first chapter and Genesis second chapter, verses one through three. All right, so let's stop sharing that screen. So we have a few new people um, that are new to joining us, not new to class or yelling, so to speak. We have maybe one person that's kind of new to the teaching, but um, so we kind of want to give everybody an understanding of what we do, what we've been doing, what we're doing kind of thing. So um, thank you. All right, so what, we do, what we're doing today, we're going through the tabernacle pattern and show how the tabernacle pattern um, correlates to the physical body, to the man's body. And then that's part that's first part of class. Second part of class, we're, we're recapping Genesis 1 through 32. And so may do a little bit of popcorn, 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 and then we're going to do um, five minute pass the baton, a five minute relay where the first person starts in the first, first chapter of Exodus and kind of go on as much as you can remember. The next person picks up where they left off, pick up what they forgot and keep going. We're going to kind of pass the baton that way. So we're going to do that too in a minute. But first, what we want to do is go through the tabernacle pattern and the man. Okay. Oh, but before we do that, so when I was in the class with the adult um, last Thursday, we were going through the plagues um, of Israel, I mean, of Egypt. And Yahweh showed me how that those plagues actually go by the pattern too. So before we get done tonight, you got to remind me so I can show y'all that, okay? Y'all have to remind me. I do not want to forget that. Y'all are going to be like, what in the what? Y'all is wonderful. So, all right, let's get this done. So what I'm going to use is the Lansing site, um, the pamphlet that's the Tabernacle of Man. It's kind of hard though using it because the pages are kind of off. But this is the picture. Let me try to see if I can get it. Can y'all see the screen okay? No, it's not sharing. I didn't share my screen. No wonder you can't see it. When I share my screen, can you see? It? <laughs> can you see right now? Yeah, we see it. Y'all see that? Okay, so this is the tabernacle compared to the physical body of the man. So remember how we were talking about um the three compartments and the tabernacle pattern and the, the migratory pattern, how everything matches. So let's recap that first, and then we'll get into the physical body and the man. So let's recap some tabernacle things real quick. 
I'm going to pull up the chart. Um, have enough pattern. I'm going to minimize this. And then, where's my tabernacle? Here we go. All right, so popcorn, popcorn, popcorn for just a second. And if you're not familiar with what popcorn, popcorn, popcorn means, I call it, uh, I forgot what I call it, y'all call it popcorn. But um, you guys are going to hand it off to each other. So you score points. When you get the answer right, you actually score points, okay? And if you are not sure what the answer is, you can popcorn it to somebody else. All right, let's see. So, Peanut, you want to start us off? We're going to go through the seven steps of the tabernacle pattern, seven steps in the migratory pattern um, is what we're going to popcorn about. Peanut, you ready? You got to unmute yourself. Why come I can't hear my peanut? Peanut, you got to unmute your phone. Nope, not yet. All right. Paige, you want to go first? Yeah. All right. So what is the first step in the tabernacle pattern? The gate. The gate. Very good. Popcorn, popcorn, popcorn. Popcorn to somebody. Sean. All right, Sean. What? <laughs> What is the third step in the migratory pattern? Um, the Red Sea. The Red Sea, very good. I'm going to pass it to uh, Amir. All right, Amir. What is, the, what is the fifth step in the tabernacle pattern? Holy place. The holy place, very good. Popcorn, popcorn, pass it to somebody else. I think I'm ready. Okay, Peanut. Oh, hey, Peanut. Okay. Hey. All right, Peanut. Hey. What is the third step in the tabernacle pattern? The third step, the court roundabout. Or the blade no. Thank the you, brave Sugar. Brave. Yes, the brave labor. What in the world? All right, the brave labor. That's right. Resume, popcorn, popcorn to somebody else. Um, I think Sean. Okay, Sean. Mm -hmm. What is the fourth step in the tabernacle pattern? <coughs> the, uh, the door. The door, very good, popcorn. Uh, popcorn to Kobe. All right, Kobe. What is the fifth step in the migratory pattern. The, uh, um, the Jordan River. The five, number five, not six, five, fifth. Uh, fifth. Um, what is it? Is the, the, the Department of Racy? Nope. Mm -hmm. Popcorn, popcorn, popcorn. Um, no, the wilderness. I'm sorry. Uh, duh, the wilderness. Good night. Popcorn, boy. Uh, popcorn, Amber. Amber, okay. what is the sixth, sixth step in the tabernacle pattern? You say six? Six, number six. Um, is it the veil? Yep, the veil. Very good. Popcorn, popcorn, popcorn. Second veil. Um, yeah, the second veil. Very good, Peanut. Second veil. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, popcorn. Jaden. Is Jaden on? He is. Jaden, what is the second step in the tabernacle pattern? Alter sin sacrifice. All right. Very good. Alter sin sacrifice. Popcorn, somebody else. Alex. All right, Alex. What is the seventh step in the migratory pattern? Number seven. K. 
Canaan's land. Canaan's land, very good. Popcorn, popcorn, popcorn. Allison. All right, Allie. Allison, what is the second step in the migratory pattern? You gotta unmute yourself, Allie. I know okay, she wait. She takes some seat. I, I can hear you now. I, well, you're unmuted now. Can I hear you? Say something, Allie. You said she takes you. I can hear you now. Yep. Yep. I can hear you, Allie. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm cleaning my room, but um, is it the red seat? No, ma'am. The second step. Mm -mm. The second step. The second step. Huh? I know this one. I know this one. Peanut. Wait till your turn, baby. Okay, Peanut, what's the second step in the migratory pattern? Um the wilderness. No. Dang it. Um stop corn to somebody else. <laughs> um what about Kobe? All right, Kobe, what's the second step in the migratory pattern? The door. The door with the four points of blood. Very good. All right. Popcorn. Popcorn. Uh, I can see why you have popcorn. You got cubes and savings, Javier, huh? Popcorn, popcorn, money, money, cube, man. Kobe. All right, Q. Good night, my goodness to me. Uh, what is the third? No, what's the sixth step in the migratory pattern, Q? River Jordan. River Jordan, very good. Popcorn, popcorn, popcorn. John Tavis. All right, John Tavis. What is the Seventh step, number seven, in the tabernacle pattern. Most holy place. Very good. Most holy place. Popcorn, popcorn, popcorn. Um, popcorn to amber. Amber, what is the first step in the migratory pattern? Um, Egypt. Egypt. Very good. I think that's all the steps. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I think there's one more step. We're missing one step. Let's see. Um, yeah, we're missing one step. Popcorn. I, I know. Yeah, the fourth step of the tabernacle pattern. I mean, the migratory pattern. Popcorn to somebody. Um, popcorn to Alex. All right, Alex, what is the fourth step in the migratory pattern? Red Sea. The, what about the Red, the Red Sea? It's the, it's the part at Red Sea. That's right, the parting of the Red Sea, very good. Awesome, awesome. So I got all the steps. So let's go through this one more time. So we know that the tabernacle pattern that Yahweh gave unto Moses, Yahweh fashioned everything after this pattern. And so you have a most holy place, holy place in the court roundabout. You have one, two, three compartments for just one tabernacle. These are called compartments. All right. And in the migratory pattern, you have Canaan land, the wilderness, in Egypt, that's why in Canaan on the chart, you have most holy place written here. In the wilderness, you have holy place written here. And in the court roundabout, you have out of court written in Egypt or out of court, court roundabout is the same thing. All right. Also, you have seven steps in the tabernacle pattern. The first step, let's go through the first the steps, y'all. First step is the gate. This wide gate here. The second step is the altar of Sin sacrifice with the four points of blood on it. 
The third step is the brazen labor or the water. The fourth step is the door of the tabernacle between the court roundabout into the holy place. So the door is the entrance between from the court roundabout into the holy place. Okay. The fifth step is the holy place itself. The entire holy place is the fifth step. The sixth step is the second veil, the second veil here. Because even though this veil is here and it looks like it starts here, this veil right here actually starts here. But they have it open on the picture so you can see what was actually in the holy place. So this is the first veil. This is the second veil, which is here. So the sixth step is the second veil, like Peanut said. And the seventh step is the most holy place. So you have the, holy, the most holy place and the holy place separated by the second veil. And then you have the holy place and the court roundabout separated by the first veil here. And then there's a door that leads you from the court roundabout into the holy place. And so in a migratory pattern, Canaan Lamb represents the most holy place separated by the second veil, which is River Jordan. And the wilderness is like the holy place separated by the veil of the Red Sea into Egypt. And so when you're going through these seven steps, the gate, the first step in the tabernacle pattern is the gate. The first step in the migratory pattern is Egypt itself. The land of Egypt is the first step. The second step. And the tabernacle is the altar of sin sacrifice where they offered up those animals and have the four points of blood on the altar. So the second step in Egypt would be the door with the four points of blood on it, the blood of the lamb or the blood of the sacrifice. The third step is the brazen labor or the water. So the third step would actually be the Red Sea itself. The fourth step is the door. So the fourth step in the pattern is the parting of the Red Sea that leads from Egypt to the wilderness. Okay. The fifth step is the holy place. So the fifth step is the wilderness. The sixth step is the second veil. So the sixth step will be the River Jordan or Jordan River. And the seventh step is the most holy place. So the seventh step will be Canaan's land. So we got that. Everybody did pretty good. Y'all did really good. Okay. Now, you also have the man is made in the likeness and image of Yahweh Elohim, and it also goes according to this pattern. So in the tabernacle pattern, you have this three-in-one configuration, the two archangels, Michael and Gabriel, sitting on the mercy, standing on the mercy seat looking at Yahweh, and they're on top of this Ark of the Covenant. So this is a three-in-one configuration, and it's just one piece. It's in the most holy place. And in the holy place, you have the altar of incense. You have the seven branch golden candlestick. And you have the golden table of showbread or shoe bread. Then in the court roundabout, you have the other three vessels, which you have the altar of sin sacrifice, the brazen altar of sin sacrifice. What was it made out of? What kind of metal, y'all? Brass. Brass. Brass, very good. Brazen altar of sin sacrifice, the brazen labor, where they had to wash the animals and the high priest and the low priest had to wash themselves, and then the cup of holy anointing oil um, as well. So you have three pieces in the court roundabout, three pieces in the holy place, and a three in one configuration in the most holy place. Okay? And so let's look at the man also. Okay? So. When we look at the man, I'm going to actually, let's see, how are we going to do this? I'm going to pull it up again as a second page, so we don't have to be scrolling back and forth. You can go to idmrlansing.blog to pull this up. You can pull up all the, you know, different transcripts, different pamphlets, different class materials. And so if you click on books, transcripts, and class materials, and click on books, transcripts, class materials again, you would go to pamphlet, printable pamphlet. All right, and the name of this tabernacle, this tabernacle of man is the name of this pamphlet that we're going through, the printable version of it. And the reason why it's kind of hard to kind of go through it, see how you have the different pages. This is page 21, and then this is page 20, and then this is page two and 19. Then 18 and 3, you know, 17, all that. So 
The reason why it's like that is so when it's printed and you set them on top of each other and staple them, they're actually in the form of a pamphlet. And so that's the reason why it's done like this. But um, So we're going to go to page nine, I believe it is, first. Uh, let's see. Yeah, nine, I believe. Here we go. So page nine actually starts talking about the comparison of the mosaic tabernacle and man's body. So we're going to be clicking back and forth page to page. So this, this particular part of class, we're just going to kind of listen and learn. Okay, so if y'all want to take notes and things like that, because you will be tested on it next week. So number one, the most holy place of the mosaic tabernacle shows the two archangels or cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings touching in the middle. Oh, sorry. The most holy place. Two shows the archangels. Three illustrates the cloud dwelling between them and the world of the Zah. One sees the two tables of the world of the Zah. Two archangels. This may not be the page I want to start on. Let me see. Um, where's page 10? Goodness, this is hard to figure out. Page 10. Is there not a page team? Okay. Is the class our page team? 219, 318. This may be 10. Where is 10? 7, 14, 8, 13. Oh, forget it. We'll just start on page 12 then. All right. Number one, the cranial or head cavity of man's physical body corresponds with the most holy place of the mosaic um, tabernacle. So number one, this is the cranial or the head cavity of the um, man's head corresponds with the most holy place, okay? Number two, the right and left halves of the brain, which come together in the midline, correspond with the two archangels. And the two main functions of the brain, oh, and the two main functions of the brain, one in carrying out some action or the motor function corresponds to the duties of Michael, and two, the sending and receiving messages, the sensory functions corresponds to the duties of Gabriel. And what that means is, you know how in your brain you have two halves of your brain, you have the left and the right, and so one side of your brain the functions of that side are the motor nerves or the motor skills that kind of, like if you touch something hot, it sends a signal to the motor function of your brain and it makes you move your hand real fast. It, it's, the, it's the motor nerves that cause you to move your hand real fast. But the sensory nerves is actually the part that sends the signal to tell your hand it's touching something hot. So it actually sends messages. And when you look at Michael and Gabriel, Michael was the warrior, Gabriel was the messenger. And so your two, the brain the two halves of your brain, they also function the same way that the archangels function as well. And that's what the two halves of your brain are representing, the two archangels. Okay. Then, number three, the brain itself is composed of gray and white matter likened unto a cloud which overshadows the mercy seat. And it, it is by means of our brain that we are in touch with and minutely aware of everything going on around us. It is really like one great big cyclotic eye in our head. Even the two eyes see as one eye. The pineal gland, located in the center of the brain, is likened unto a cyclotic eye by the ancient or Greek mythologists and also was thought to be the seat of all sensations. And so the pineal gland was thought to be the seat of all of your sensations, which is corresponding to this mercy seat here that the two archangels are sitting on, okay? Then you have the two lobes of the pituitary gland, the master gland of the body, corresponds to the two tables of the Mosaic Law. And they are placed in a bony receptacle in the base of the brain and are covered, and covered over by a covering, just as the lid covered the Ark of the Covenant. 
In our diagram on the right, you will see the word law in the mouth of the figure. See, right here. See how it has law here? Y'all see that? All right. This is to show the close approximation of the pituitary gland to the roof of the mouth. And at and it is out of the mouth that the law proceeds. Malachi wrote, the law of the truth was in his mouth. Okay, so now let's look at that. So basically in the most holy place corresponds to the head cavity. In the head cavity, you have the two halves of the brain, which represents Michael and Gabriel. You have um, the penal gland, and then you also have the pituitary gland. The penal gland is actually the seat of your sensations, which is like the mercy seat. And the pituitary gland actually is in the roof of your mouth or at the very base or bottom of your brain. And on that pituitary gland, you have, I think it's, is it 10 enzymes? You have uh, seven on one lobe and three on the other lobe. Maybe not, maybe it's not enzymes, I'm thinking of the wrong word. Maybe it is enzymes, but anyway, it's, it's like into the seven laws on one part, on one half of the um, table of stones and three on the other side. And so the pituitary gland actually represents um, the law that was put in the Ark of the Covenant. I'm just gonna touch on these real quick and then we'll move on. So then, Um, the vision of the Shekinah seen in the cloud in the most holy place of the tabernacle can be correlated with the configuration. Let me find page 13. Good. And this is terrible. Of the blood vessels supplying the brain, which take the shape of a stick figure of a man, which is representing Elohim. So you have um, a stick figure in your brain. Let me see if I can pull up a picture of it real quick. If you cut the brain in half, if you cut the brain open, there's like a picture of a stick man in there. I think it's called a circle, circle, nope. What do you call it? Let's see. What do you call the stick man? What is he called? Oh, crap. What is it called? What is it called? Is it circle the circle of, of Willis? Circle of Willis? That's what it's called. Are we sure? I know there's yep, arterial the yeah. Yeah, the stick, yeah. So we have this chart actually in class. So if you put like you have a little stick figure in the middle of the brain, which is likened to Elohim in shape and form in the midst of the cloud. All right, so then number five, we have the second veil of the mosaic. Tabernacle divides the most holy place from the holy place, and it's blue, purple, and scarlet in color. This corresponds with the neck of man's physical body, which divides the head or cranial cavity from the chest cavity. All the blood vessels passing to the head are gathered together in the neck in one great profusion. The veins, colored blue to denote impure blood, the arteries colored red or scarlet to denote pure or oxygenated blood. And the presence of the iodine filled thyroid gland, iodine means violet or purple, denotes the purple of this dividing veil of the neck. And so in your neck, you have blue, purple, and scarlet. You have the veins and arteries and the thyroid gland in your neck here. So as you're coming from the head cavity to the chest cavity, you're going through that second veil or the blue, purple, and scarlet veil, just like in the tabernacle, okay? In the holy place of the Mosaic tabernacle, one sees the high priest standing at the golden altar of incense, burning incense, which consisted of four principal ingredients called stack, or nisha, or onika, I don't know how to say it. and frankincense, which were sweet odoriferous spices. This incense perfumed the entire tabernacle and ascended through the second veil into the most holy place where Yahweh dwelled in the cloud above the mercy seat. And with a sweet smelling savor to him, for it represented the intercession made 
by the Holy Spirit to the Father, Yahweh. So, number six, you have the altar of incense. And it has those four ingredients, um, the stacks on each of galbanum and frankincense. And so that actually represents the altar of incense, okay? Which is still, which is like into your lungs. Because when you breathe in your lung and you're in the air, what four elements is in the air? Um, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, right? Is it nitro- is nitrogen the fourth one? Mm-hmm. Nitrogen. So you have those four ingredients that make up the air that you breathe, just like you have the four ingredients in the um, altar of incense. So the altar of incense, the lungs represent the altar of incense. Okay. Next. The seven branch golden candlestick can be seen on the left in the holy place and it give and it gave light unto the sanctuary so that there was never any darkness there. It was extinguished at nine o'clock in the morning when the daylight illuminated the sanctuary. It was trimmed and made ready for the relighting at three o'clock in the afternoon when daylight began to fade and it would burn all through the night until the next morning. All the seven branches of it proceeded out of the main stem on either side, and it was filled with oil from the main stem. Okay, this is confusing me. Father, have mercy. 13, 14. Where's 14, 15, 16? And so that is represented by, so you got the branch, you got number eight represented by the A order here. And on the A order of the heart, you have seven uh, lobes, the seven branches in the A order of the heart as well, and they constantly flicker. They constantly flicker just like this seven branch folding candlestick. So the seven branch candlestick is represented by the A order here. All right. Number nine is the table of showbread, which represents the heart. Where am I at? Did I scroll down? I wasn't trying to scroll down, Father. We should have printed this out. The table, golden table of showbread can be seen on the right hand, right side of the holy place, with its two rows of bread, six rows on either side. It is a four-sided furnishing with a golden crown around the border of it. The high priest ate daily of the bread on the table of showbread which was kept ever present for him. This was his daily sustenance, as well as the meat offering and drink offering of which he partook. Comparing the holy place of the tabernacle with six, the chest cavity of the physical body, one finds number seven, the lungs serving the same capacity or function as the golden altar of incense. To be real polytechnical, one finds that the larynx situated above the windpipe or trachea has two superior cornu horn, cornu or horn, and two inferior cornu, just as the golden altar of incense had four horns on it, one at each corner. So what he's saying is that, um, you know, the lungs represents the altar of incense, but the larynx, which is above the windpipe or the trachea, I can't really see the larynx. Um, or the trachea, it has four horns on it. Cornu, which cornu means horns, just like the altar of incense had four horns on it. See if we can see it better over here. The altar of incense has these four horns on it, just like the trachea has four horns on it. So that's been real technical there. All right. The air which we breathe is composed mainly of four ingredients, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, as aqueous vapor, which corresponds to the four principal ingredients of the incense burned on the golden altar of incense. Yes, and air or oxygen is burned in our body for the process of oxidation, which is the uniting of oxygen with other substance in a burning process. 
It need not be said that breathing of good fresh air is a sweet smelling savor unto all of the tissues of the body and that it fragrances all of the body just as the incense did the tabernacle. The rain corresponding to the clouds where Yahweh dwells is especially expectant and desirous of this air or oxygen as it is the most vulnerable of all the body tissues when it comes to oxygen lack. Remember the in- west wasting through the second veil into the most holy place. Let us remind the reader at this point that Yahweh forbade anyone to duplicate the holy incense and only the high priest knew how to make it. Doesn't this compare beautifully with the fact that no one has yet been able to determine the exact composition of air, which only Yahweh knows. Okay. Page 15. The seven branched golden candlestick corresponds with the A order, that great blood vessel which comes off the heart and has the seven branches which distribute oxygenated blood to the all the body. Note. We shall designate the seven branches of the candlestick by letters if to differentiate to differentiate or distinguish from our regular use of numbers. The in and the innominate the innominate artery coming off of the arc of the A order typifies the main theme of the candlestick and it gives off the right common uh, carotoid and right subclavian arteries, these are words that I, don't, I know y'all ain't going to be able to understand all these words. The left common art. So basically, like I said, the seven branch candlestick corresponds with the A order and it has seven branches on it, just like the seven branch candlestick have, have seven branches on it. The table of showbread compares with the um, four chambered heart. So the table of showbread compares to the heart, which has four chambers, um, as the golden candlestick was placed on the one side of the holy place and the golden table of showbread on the other side, so is the heart placed more to the left side and the A order more to the right side of the body. The four chambers of the heart compares with the four corners of the table of showbread. The bread placed in two rows on the table signifies the two halves of the heart, the right and the left. The golden crown around the border of the table corresponds to the coronary which coronary means crown, coronary vessels encircling the heart, and the heart is truly one's daily bread, for it is by the constant beating of the heart that life is sustained. So the A order um, is part of the heart, but it's on one side of the heart, just like the seven branch candlestick was on one side of the holy place. And then the heart itself was, um, it has those two halves of it. And it has a gold crown going around the heart, just like the table of showbread had a gold crown going around it. So the table of showbread represents the heart. The seven branch candlestick represents the A order. The altar of incense represents the lungs. You had the two archangels represent the left and right half of the brain. Um, the penal gland represents the mercy seat. The pituitary gland represents the law that's in the Ark of the Covenant. Let's move on down to the next one, and then we'll keep going. All right, number 10. The first veil separated the holy place from the outer court, and entrance was by the door seen in our diagram. Oh, let's find page 16, 16, 16, 16. Goodness. All right. Hold on, guys. Carla, I just uh, sent you a chat. I sent you the PDF. I think if you open it in the PDF, the pages are in order. Oh, that would be so awesome. Let's try that. You sent it to my email? Yeah. Okay. Let me pull my email up. That is so awesome. Thank you. You're going to pull it up. It's Tabernacle of Man, right? Yep. Okay. Oops, that is the wrong. Wow, I'm glad I did not show y'all that. Okay. <laughs> that is it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's opening up. Okay. 
Hello. All right, let's share the screen again. I hope y'all studied uh, Exodus 1 through 30 something. All right, what page are we on? 16? What do you want to say? 16. So red. Yep, this thing. All right. So the first veil, thank you, ma'am. The first veil separated the holy place from the outer court, and entrance was by the door seen in our diagram on the left. Immediately before the door is the brazen labor, okay, which contained water for washing the sacrificial animals before placing them on the brazen altar of sin sacrifice, which is located just inside the gate. Of the outer court. The brazen laver had a foot or pedestal on which it stood, and the brazen altar was a four cornered furnishing with a horn on each corner where blood was placed during the sacrificial ceremony. Over the head of the high priest is pictured a vessel containing the holy anointing oil, which was poured on the head of the priest and signified anointing by the Holy Spirit or quickening. In the diagram on the, right, on the right, one can see that the diaphragm forms the first veil and separated the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. So let's look at that. So you have the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity. You got the head cavity, chest cavity, abdominal cavity or head cavity, chest cavity, abdominal cavity here. So abdominal means your stomach. Then you have your chest and you have your head. Okay, so you have the head cavity, chest cavity, abdominal cavity. You have the most holy place, holy place, court roundabout. The head represents the most holy place, the chest represents the holy place, and the stomach represents the court roundabout. In the head, you have your brain, um, the pituitary gland, the penile gland, all of those represent these vessels here. So you have two sides to your brain, the left and right, which represents the archangels, Michael and Gabriel. One side of your brain um, has motor skills or it actually causes you to move and function. The other side is the sensory side, which causes it sends messages to different parts of your body. And so Michael was the, like the motor nerve. He was the one that actually went out and did all the fighting. And Gabriel was always the messenger. So they actually represent the right and left side of the brain. The penal gland um, is the seat of all of the senses, which is like into this mercy seat that they actually sit on. At the base of the mouth, or the roof, excuse me, the roof of your mouth, the base of your brain, right in here, in the base of your mouth, base of the brain, which is the roof of your mouth, you have the, the pituitary gland, which had two lobes or two parts to it, and it had those enzymes on it. Am I saying, is it enzymes? Am I saying it right? And you had seven enzymes on one part of the pituitary gland and three on the other part of the pituitary gland. Just like this law had seven laws on one side and three laws on the other. That's why you have law in the mouth of the man here, because it's representing the pituitary gland. Then in the second veil, which is blue, purple, and scarlet, or blue, purple, and red, from the head to the, I mean, from the most holy place to the holy place, it's represented by the veins, arteries, and thyroid gland in the man's neck. So here you have the veins, which are um, blue, because it, it holds the, um, impure blood, the arteries hold the pure blood, which are red, and the thyroid has the iodine, which is purple. So you have blue, purple, and scarlet in the neck of the man coming from his most holy place to his holy place or from his head to his chest. In the chest cavity, you have these three, same three um, furnishings here are just like the three that are in the man's chest cavity. You have the lung and you have the heart and the A order. So the lungs are represented by the altar of incense, or the altar of incense are represented by the lungs. And then you have the A order correlates to the seven branch candlestick. The heart 
is correlating to the table of showbread. Now we're in the stomach. When you pass through the first veil from the holy place to the court roundabout, you have the diaphragm, which is the same thing that um, separates the, the chest cavity from the stomach or the abdominal cavity. Goodness, that was a lot to say. All right, let's try this. Nope, that's the Elohim book. Where was I? Where did I pull that email up from? Goodness gracious. Here we go. All right. All right, so in our di diagram on the right one, you can see the diaphragm from the first veil and separate the chest cavity, the abdominal cavity, from the abdomin abdominal cavity, which is the outer court of the physical body, and that the two kidneys, which are ordinarily located in the right and left flank, are brought together to form a perfect configuration of the brazen labor. One might ask the question, why then are they, the two kidneys, separated in the physical body? It is to prove conclusively, since the kidneys with water placed therein represent the Red Sea in the migratory pattern, that Yahweh really did divide the waters of the Red Sea for Moses and the Israelites. So let's look at that. Now we just went through the seven steps and y'all said that the third step in the tabernacle pattern is the brazen labor. And in the migratory pattern, the third step is the Red Sea. And represented uh, or correlating to this would be your kidney, which washes your food or cleans, cleans your sacrifices. So every time you eat, it's carried to the kidneys for the kidneys to actually purify it or cleanse it. Um, and so that's the same thing when they had to offer those sacrifices, they had to be washed in the raising labor. Where in your body, the kidneys are separated. You have one on one side, one on the other side. But when you put them together, they actually make a perfect brazen labor, just like the brazen labor in the tabernacle. But the reason why they're divided is the same reason why the third step as the Red Sea, you have the Red Sea divided. And so Yahweh divided the kidneys in the body of the man to show that he truly did divide the waters of the Red Sea. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. All right. Got another. That's deep. It is. That Very makes deep. sense. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Let's keep going. All right. The foot of the brazen labor is formed by the two uh, ureter ureters. How do you say that? Descending from the kidneys. All right. To the urinary bladder where the urine is held until passage. The protuberances above the, each kidney represents the adrenal glands, which contain the substance adrenaline, which quickens the various muscles and other tissues of the body, just as the holy anointing oil did the high priest. So the adrenal gland rep is represented by the holy anointing oil. Because if you ever heard how, you know, adrenaline is pumping, oh, oh, oh. Have you ever seen videos where, like, a bus gets stuck on a kid and the, the mother of the kid come and pick the bus up off the child? Like, how in the world does she get strong enough to pick up a bus? It's because her adrenaline gave her a quickening and it caused her to be able to give her strength to pick that bus up off her child because her adrenaline was. So the adrenal gland actually gives off adrenaline or it causes the quickening in the muscles and other tissues of the body, just like the cup, cup, the holy, the cup of holy anointing oil, uh, which the high priest um, had to be anointed with, is likened to the Holy Spirit that quickens you, or um, it gives you, a, it quick, quickens your spirit, basically. The so it's frame like, mm -hmm. So it's like your body going into overdrive, pretty much. Pretty much, that's right. The picture frame configuration of the large intestines represent the brazen altar and the small intestines where most of the food is digested, burned, are located within the, this frame. The food thus becomes the sacrifice which is burned on the altar. The gate of the outer court corresponds with the rectal opening by which all waste products of digestion are eliminated just as the skin, hair, and other portions of the sacrificial animals were taken without the camp and discarded or burned. 
So basically what he's saying is that the, uh, the altar of sin sacrifice is represented by the large and small intestines. This is where the food, when you eat your food, this is where your food is burned in the small intestines here. Just like they had to burn the sacrifices on the altar of sin sacrifice here. But then the gate is represented by the anal gland or your butt, basically. And whenever you eat your food, whatever waste is left over, you have to boo-boo, basically, is what he's saying. And so you have to take a dump or you dump your, the stuff that your body doesn't need. And so the hair and other things that they didn't use of the animal, they had to take it outside the gate and dump it and burn it. And so your body does the same thing. Whenever your sacrifices that you eat, whatever is not needed, your body actually dumps it. Also, there's a spigot on this um, brazen laver where they have to let the dirty water out. And so with your kidneys there, whatever the dirty water has to be let out, you have a spigot where you actually use the bathroom too or you urinate. Um, for the young ones, urinate means you have to go pee. And so the body is made up just like the tabernacle. Y'all, we did all of it just like the tabernacle um, because he made man in his likeness and in his image, okay? All right, let's keep going. Let's see. <laughs> All right, the bone structure of man's physical body represents the pillars, bars, and boards, which are the supporting structures of the tabernacle. The tibia bone in the leg or femur bone in the thigh are good examples of a pillar, which made up the tabernacle. The flat bones, such as like the scapula, and the bones of the skull are good examples of the board of the tabernacle. Whereas the short, stubby bones as the metacarpal bones of the hand, the metatarsal bones of the foot are good examples of the bars of the tabernacle. This then has been a polytechnical comparison of the mosaic tabernacle with the tabernacle of man's body. But please bear in mind that the physical or visible things point to the invisible or spiritual things. Yes, Yahshua the Messiah was a physical man, just like you or I, but he was really Yahweh, who is spirit manifested in a visible form. Therefore, all of the component parts or members of our physical body are physical expressions of spiritual things, such as intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, Love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength, which are the divine attributes or members which make up the spiritual superincorporeal body of Elohim. Let's break down what he just said. So basically, even though we have this tabernacle, oh, this tabernacle pattern, and how it matches the physical man's body matches the tabernacle pattern and all those things like that. And this was a physical tabernacle. All of these physical things, they are pointing to spirit. And yes, Yahshua the Messiah um, manifest or Yahweh manifested in a physical body as Yahshua the Messiah. But he was actually Yahweh manifested in that body. And we know that Yahweh is spirit. So when you look on the chart here, we see that Yahweh also has nine major attributes, intelligence, wisdom and knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength. And those nine major attributes took on shape and form as Elohim. So in the head cavity, you have intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge in the head cavity. You have love, beauty and justice in the chest cavity, and then you have foundation, power and strength in the abdominal cavity, which made up Yahweh Elohim, which was like into the tabernacle. So let's look at it again. You have intelligence, wisdom and knowledge, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power and strength. So these nine major attributes of Yahweh are represented by these nine vessels, major vessels in the tabernacle, which are also represented by the nine 
major organs in your body, which are also represented by the nine major systems in your body, and also the nine major plant, the nine, nine planets in the system, the nine numbers in the number system, I mean, I said this, in the solar system, nine planets in the solar system. And so all of these things are going according to Yahweh's pattern. And so basically what he's saying is that all of these physical things have spiritual meanings to them. They have a deeper meaning, which is spirit. In summation, or in just saying everything we just said, we're going to sum it all up. Let me say that this simple Yahweh given pattern not only fits the physical body, but everything in the cosmographical makeup of the universe. So this pattern fits everything in the universe. The smallest bit of matter that man has any knowledge of, the atom, is basically composed of a proton, neutron, and electron, corresponding to the most holy place, holy place, and outer court of the Mosaic Tabernacle. And the scientists to date have found only nine subatomic particles which make up the atom. I wonder why they can only find nine particles of the atom. Because Yahweh has... It makes sense. He has nine major attributes. You have nine major vessels in the tabernacle. You have nine major organs in your body. There's a pattern that he's following. Which further compares with the nine furnishings of the tabernacle, which are the Ark of the Covenant, with an archangel on either side being made of one piece, was a three-in-one furnishing in the most holy place. The golden altar of incense, the table of showbread, and golden candlestick were the three furnishings in the holy place. And the brazen laver, the holy anointing oil, and brazen altar of sacrifice were the three furnishings in the outer court. The minute cell, whether animal or plant, is threefold, being composed of a nucleolus, a nucleus, and a cell body. All matter is either a gas, liquid, or solid. They got three in one. So no matter which way we, one turns, this divine pattern has a situation covered. Why? Because it is Elohim himself, or he is the archetype, or the original, or archetype means original, original pattern of everything, and the pattern proves his existence and manifests his eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Okay? So pretty much, what we're going to be going over, um, which I'll send all of y'all this template. So what, I, what y'all need to know next week, when we get to next week and we start doing our little tests and all that kind of stuff like that, if I point to, say if I point to A order, then y'all are going to tell me that the A order is represented by what? What does the A order represent or what does it correspond to in the tabernacle? That was good. The candlestick, very good. Um, what is the kit? What do the kidneys represent? Brazen labor. The brazen labor. The brazen labor, very good. What about the lungs? The, the uh, altar of incense. Altar of sin sacrifice. Wait, no. The altar of incense, right? Incense, right? Altar of incense, very good. The altar of sin sacrifice is represented by what? Which one of these represents the altar of sin sacrifice? This term. Huh? Wait, what this was the question you mean? This term. The question is which part of the stomach? So the large and small the intestine. Altar, the large and small intestine. So the question Braxton was the altar of sin sacrifice, which organ in the physical body represents the altar of sin sacrifice? So which vessel in the physical body represents the gold, the golden table of showbread? Which one represents the golden table of showbread? The heart. Yeah, the, the heart. Very good. Very good. Very good. The heart. So let's look at this. So the heart and the A order have been separated for a reason. Even though the A order is a part of the heart, the A order is represent or represents the golden seven branch candle, golden seven branch candlestick. Because the A order has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven branches on it, 
just like the seven branch candlestick to have seven branches on it. The heart represents the table of showbread, and the heart has a gold crown going around it called, uh oh, excuse me, the book, called the um, carnu, I believe it is, which, which means crown. And so the heart represents the golden table of showbread, the A order represents the seven branch candlestick, and the lungs represent the altar of incense. How many components make up the incense in the altar of incense? How many parts do you have? How many components? Four. Four. And how many components do you have to the air that you breathe? Four. Four. Do y'all remember what those components are? What's the air that you breathe? Carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Very good. Carbon dioxide, hydrogen, um, nitrogen, and oxygen. I don't know if I said that one. Okay. And what about what part in the most holy place or in the head cavity represents the law that was in the Ark of the Covenant? Do y'all remember? The roof of the mouth. Okay, what's that what's that part called? It's a gland. What 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 gland is it? Pituitary. Pituitary gland. Very good. I think I see you, Jantay. It's okay. All right. What part of the physical body represents the brain? I said what part of the physical what part of the tabernacle does the brain <laughs> represent? <laughs> I was told like, wait a minute, what? Oh uh, yeah. The cloud. The cloud. <laughs> the cloud. Okay, what about the left and right halves of the brain? Two archangels. The two archangels. Very good. All right. So I I, I, I think I think y'all will be able to get this. So what I'm gonna do, um I'll send y'all the link to um well no, I'm gonna try to send y'all what Sonya sent me, the the one that's in order. So you guys will have it and you, you can study it. Um, Peanut, what I'll do for you, I'll put Peanut and Braxton, um, I'll put, um, I'll label each part so you'll know what it is and so you can compare it to the tabernacle. I'll label it and send it to your mom. Y'all can work on it. Okay. All right. Y'all ready for the second part of class? Y'all ready to get this thing started? Did y'all recap? Because this is the part that y'all got to go against the grown-ups with. Not the tabernacle. Tabernacle is what y'all learned today. But the recap from Genesis, I mean, Exodus 1 through 32 is what y'all will have to be going against the grown-ups with. Questions from those parts of the scriptures are what we're going to be asking. And um, y'all going to have to battle the grown-ups. I promise y'all got this. Y'all going to tear them apart. Y'all better. But anyway. All right. So Exodus one through 32. Who wants to get started in Exodus first chapter? So what we're going to do, we got five minutes and you can start in the first chapter of Exodus, whatever you remember that happened from Exodus, the first chapter all the way over. And then once I stop you, go ahead and stop. Whoever wants to pick up where they left off, then you can keep going. And nobody can say anything wrong. There's not anything, you, no fear. We just going to kind of recap or refresh ourselves. There's no points involved, nothing like that. We're just kind of picking up where we left off. Who wants to go first? Exodus, the first chapter on over. I joined a little late, so um, like, okay. I got my mom's text for the link at, at about 7.06. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay. I'm going to get your mama for letting you join late. She should have it, gave it to you when I first sent it. Okay. Well, you don't have to participate if you don't want to right now. You can just kind of listen. But um, what we're doing, because before you joined the group, Braxton, we were going through Exodus, the first chapter, all the way over to the, we all we got all that thing to 32, 34, whatever. So we're just remembering everything that we read from Exodus, the first chapter on over. Um, do y'all want me to get y'all started or somebody wants to go first? Anybody want to be brave and go first? I'll go first. Okay, sure. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. All right. All right, so um, Exodus, ex Exodus first chapter um, starts out by talking about um, the 70 souls that uh, came from Jacob. 
And then there was a new king that uh, that rose over Egypt that wasn't Joseph. Yeah, it says, which knew not Joseph, okay. Um, and there were task ma- uh, taskmasters that, um, that afflicted the uh, children of Israel with uh, burdens, uh, and they built feral treasure cities, uh, the Pithom and Ramses. And then... Um, there were uh, a death decree, a death decree. If there was uh, a son to be born, he killed, or he would have to be killed. And there, uh, if there were a daughter was to be born, then uh, she would live. And um, I can't remember nothing else from the first chapter. So second chapter was when Moses was born of the Levi. And uh, they said that he was a goodly child and uh, his mother hit him three months. And when she couldn't hide uh, hide him no more, she uh, put uh, bulrushes on it and dabbed it with slime and hit it by the river's brink. And his sister stood uh, far out and found her. Wait, then the daughter of Pharaoh. Um, who found her? I think it was, oh, the daughter of Pharaoh found Moses. And the daughter of Pharaoh, uh, she opened opened it and saw Moses in the, uh, um, oh, okay. And then his sister, uh, hold on. Oh, okay. And then they gave him, uh, gave him to the uh, nurse, which was actually his mother. And, um, the nurse took care of Moses. And then I remember it mentioned that Moses' real father, the name was Ruel. Um, uh, I'm kind of losing my memory. Let me see. It's been a minute. It's been a minute, okay. We, yeah, no, I'm saying that's why you do, we've been we've been on the tabernacle for about three four weeks now, so yeah. <laughs> Sure. Okay. It's been a while before we did this, so yeah. But you can yeah. keep going, whatever you remember, even if it's you know, if you gotta jump to some other stuff, that's fine. Just whatever you remember. Okay. Well, I guess I'll jump over to chapter three. I remember uh they went to the they went to a mountain that was even to Horeb, the mountain of Horeb. Um that was when the burning bush, yeah, the burning bush event happened. And Moses uh, saw it, and he turned aside. And Yahweh spake through the um, burning bush, um, and he had to put off his shoes because the floor was, um, or the ground was holy. Um, and then, um, oh, and then yeah, that's right. Yahweh said that he's seen the affliction of the children of Israel in Egypt. And then he said that he came down to um, deliver them out of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land of uh, flowing with milk and honey. And then um, Moses asked, um, who should he, uh, what name does he go by? And Yahweh said, Ayer, I said, Ayer. Wait, let me look over that again. I don't know if I said that right. Um, Ayer, Asher. Asher, Aya, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so Moses asked, um, well, what name should he give the children of Israel? And uh and he said, Ayer Asher Ayer. And he said, I will be have me sent unto you. Uh, and he said that uh he's the Elohim of your fathers, or the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And that, that that is his name forever and for in his memorial to all generations. And um let's see. Um, and then in the next chapter, I remember in the fourth chapter it talks about how uh the rod when um Moses he picked up a rod. And uh, when he cast it down onto the ground, it became a serpent. And Yahweh told him to pick it up by its tail. And when he did, it became a rod again. And um, he told him to put his hand in his bosom. 
And when he took it out, his hand was leprous and snow. And then when he put it back in his bosom and he put it out, it was uh, back to his normal flesh. And um, uh, okay, pause. Okay, that's five minutes. All right. Very good. All right, all right. Who wants to go next? Pick up where Sean left off. He could pick up some things that he forgot or missed or whatever, and then keep going. Who wants to pass? Who wants to go next? Pick up the time and keep going. Okay. All right, Andy. All right, in the second chapter, um. So he he was here for three months. Well, Moses was here for three months, and because of the death decree, and um, Pharaoh's daughter came and found him and took him back, and his mother ended up being the one to nurse him, and then he grew up in Pharaoh's household. Um, so over in the third chapter. Um, he kept the flock of Jethro, um, and so he had the vision of the burning bush. It was in flames, but not being consumed, and he turned aside to see why the bush did not burn, and Yahweh saw that he turned aside, and it was like Yahweh um, had his attention with that vision to show him um to be able like to show him self. And he told him to take off the shoes from off his feet because he was standing on holy ground. And um Yahweh told Moses that he seen the affliction of the people in Egypt and then he'll come down and deliver them um into a, a land full of milk and honey. And um, so Moses was like, when I go down to deliver these people and they ask me who sent me, who should I tell them? And he said, um, tell them Ai, Asher, Ai, uh, meaning I will be, has sent you. And, um, Yahweh, asked, uh, Moses asked also, um, you know, uh, wait, hold on. Mm. Oh, and he told him that he, that's when uh, Elohim declared that that was his name forever and his memorial to all generations. And so um, he told him to go and gather the elders of Israel and tell them that he appeared unto him. And he tell him that, tell them that he has seen that, he has remembered and seen that which is done to them in Egypt. And then, um, let's see, I'm going to go to the fourth chapter. Um, that's when Yahweh began to show, began to uh, give him signs, signs uh, to know that. Um, so, well, he started giving him signs. And Yahweh told him to cast out the rod. And it became a serpent. And then he picked up the rod. He told him to pick up the rod by the tail or by the the lie, as we've learned. And um, it turned back whole. It turned back to the rod again. And then the second one, he told him to put his hand into the book, into his bosom. And his hand um, was leprous as snow. And then he put his hand back into his bosom. And when he pulled it out, it was turning to flesh again. Uh, and he said that if they don't believe, they won't hearken to the sign, to the first sign. So you give them the second sign. You show them the second sign. Um, and that's like and until two witnesses shall now be established. Um, and then let's see what else in the fourth chapter. Um, uh, Okay, so um, Moses was still questioning Yahweh and kind of angered Yahweh. And he asked him, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? And because Moses was making excuses saying that he couldn't speak plain or that, like, 
I can't even really speak eloquently, so they won't believe me. And so he told him to take Aaron, his brother, with him. And so they went, Aaron, let's see. So then they went into Pharaoh's house and, hold on, wait, no, they didn't wait, they wait, did they? Okay, so Aaron and Moses went off into Egypt and they, Mm, pause. Wait. Pause of five minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Yeah, <laughs> yes, sir. You may go. Okay. Right. Hold up. I'm trying to I'm trying to see where where part the part that she stopped it. Um, I I was in the middle of it. the fourth chapter, but I kept wanting to go ahead, so that's why like, I got caught. Like, which, which verse? So I can so I can pick up back where I wanted um, to. Go. I stopped. Basically, at the 12th verse, 12. 13th verse, what he was talking about, he couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I want to pick back up in the third chapter because I, I feel like I feel like she left something out back on. Um, you just get the part when she said it said, um, <clears throat> and now let us pray and go three days journey into the wilderness and that we may, may sacrifice to Yahweh our island. I feel like that's a that's a very important part to say because it shows it shows the lightness unto the migratory pattern in the three days because it's everything is everything's a three a three peak just had the creation back then too. Um and also um the third sign also on the blood you turn you turn water into blood and turn it back into water. And um okay. Starting first. Um after after Yahweh said, um no, after Moses said, Oh Yahweh, um, who am I? Like who he, he Moses doubted himself because he was slow of speech and it, it angered Yahweh. And um and he said, It's not it's not Aaron the Levite, thy brother. And I know that he, he can speak well and also he coming forth to meet thee. So Yahweh had to sit from the beginning for Aaron and to Aaron, for Aaron to meet Moses. For it so they can spread the word. Um, uh, and he shall be, and he shall be that that spokesman to the people, and he shall and he shall be the the instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of Elohim. And um, and thou shalt cast a rod, and basically Yahweh told Moses to to show them show them the signs, and um. <clears throat> And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them afore, set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt. And he took the rod of, of his of his of Elohim up in his hand. And Yahweh said unto Moses, When thou goest and return, okay, let me keep going. Oh. And then Zipporah took took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin on her of her son, showing up likeness unto taking off the, the flesh and um and removing that ignorance also. Or removing that, that veil that's covering that's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um <clears throat> let's see. Um getting a little rough over here now. Okay, let's go to the six. Uh, I'm being caught in the midst now. Mm. Even if it's not in order, order, what do you, whatever you remember, that's next. Um, after God, before she can go. Into a lot of, a lot of names, man. Yeah. You know they went down to Egypt and talked to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, "What?" Oh, Moses, Moses, and no, Moses and his wife. No, I often say Moses and his wife went, but he told them that that was his sister, so they won't kill him. Um, no, you talking about Abraham, then. No, you talking about Abraham, then. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, it's been a minute for real, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul, five minutes is up. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, maybe the adults will whoop y'all. I don't know. <laughs> All right, who wants to go next? <laughs> Jimmy. Go next? Negative. No, no, you did good, though. Very good. Who wants to go next? Who was that? Who wants to go next? It, it just muted everybody. Oh. And for some reason, it's muted everybody. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll mute yourself. Braxton, do you want to go? Do you know um any of the story of Exodus? Not necessarily. Okay, you can just listen this time. And then what we're going to do for homework, we're going to go back and read and study some more in Exodus. And then next week, I'll ask y'all different questions and stuff like that. So, okay. On the next Zoom meeting or something? Huh? What's that, Dr. I said on the next Zoom meeting. Yes, sir. On the next Zoom meeting. Okay. Yep. All right. Tina, you want to go? You got to unmute yourself. Huh? You want to go next? Um, no, I'm okay. I can just listen. No, no, you're not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you questions and you can just answer, okay? Okay. All right. So how many, how many souls went down into Egypt? Um... um do you remember how many? No. 70, remember? Oh, yeah, 70. 70 souls went after each. Okay. And so when Moses was a baby and Pharaoh sent out the death decree, what did his mama do? Um, I don't know. I need some help. Um, I know that one. Okay. What, Braxton? Help him out. Um, Pretty sure she sent him down the river, didn't she? Yep, she sent him down the that little river. Like she put her in a put him in a basket and sent him down the river. Well, okay, so she put him in the ark. Okay, I was loud. So she put him in the ark in the river in the ark. Not a basket, but an ark. And she put him in the flags of the river. So she didn't float him down the river, but she put him in the flags of the river. Um, on the side where the water was going, but he didn't float down the river, but that's very good. She did put him in the ark and put him in the side of the river. All right. Okay, Tina. I don't know a little bit. I don't know a lot. That's, that's good. Just... That's good, though. All right, Tina. So, next question. All right. So, when Pharaoh's daughter took Moses out of the ark and he went and lived with her, how old was Moses when he went out to be with his brethren? Do you remember how old he was? No. Uh, maybe I could do this by myself. Um, yeah, bl blood, water, spirit, what? How old was he? 40, 40, 40. Oh, he was 40 years old. Very good. All right, he was 40 years old. And then he saw, um, he, he killed the Egyptian. He went out to the uh, wilderness and he was at the burning bush. And Yahweh told what to Moses when he said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. What do y'all always tell uh, Moses? Um, the, um, take your shoes off. Mm -hmm. and, and you were stepping on holy ground where mm -hmm. they're building the tabernacle. That's right. Very good. And then what signs did Yahweh give Moses? On the first, I guess the first sign when Aaron had the rod and he put it down and it turned into a snake. Mm -hmm. And then he and then Yahweh told him to grab it by its tail and pick it up and then it turned back into a normal rod. Mm -hmm. the, se the second. I guess the second sign was when he put his hand in his shirt, it turned white as big as snow. And then mm -hmm. when he put his hand in his shirt again, it turned, it turned back to anything 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, I forgot the third step. Um, he had to take the, the third sign. He took the water and poured it on the ground and turned into what? The Red Sea. No, it turned, no, when he poured the water on the ground, the water turned into what? Turned into... Blood. Oh, blood, blood. Yep, one more question. When he went to Pharaoh, when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, Yahweh said, let my son Israel go, what did Pharaoh say to Moses? Pharaoh said, who, who is Yahweh? And I will not give the children of Israel back. Okay, very good. Okay, very good. Awesome. Who wants to go next? Ooh, can I go? Yep. Okay. So, after after he said that, pretty sure Yahweh unleashed a few terrors on the on um his people, right? Mhm. Yep, that's right. So, one of them was like he released like cicadas and like they ate and, and ate all their crops and stuff. So they didn't have mm-hmm. anything to eat. Yep, that was a locust, right? And then what else? I, I forgot the other thing. It involved like getting a lamb's blood and spreading it on their doorway, so that way it will, they would be protected from it. But that's, that's right. Um, how 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 many plagues that Yahweh put on the Egypt? How many? Do you know how many it was? I feel like it was like three or four. It was ten. Ten. Jeez, oh. 10 plagues. I, yeah, I that thought was it was 13. Nope, it was 10. 10 plagues. So the first plague was when he turned the water into blood. The so that second plague, drink. that's right, so they couldn't drink. And the second plague was when he put all those frogs all over the land and in their houses. It was a lot of frogs. The oh, third no. plague. Yeah, he was, it was a lot of frogs. Man, they, it was all in their kitchen, in their house, in their bed. It was frogs everywhere. Jeez. And then the third plague, he turned the dust into lice. Lice are like little bitty, small little white bugs that get in your hair and all in your dog's hair. Like it was very really gross. It was lice everywhere. Jeez. And then after the third plague, it was, what's the next plague, y'all? It was flies and insects. So it was like flies everywhere. And then, after the flies, it was, what was next, you guys? It was the meringue, and so forth and so on. So I don't want to give all the plates. I know somebody else may want to give a plate. What else do you know, Braxton? Um, I don't know. I so when y'all, when y'all was told, when Moses was at the burning bush, and he asked Yahweh for a name. What did he tell Moses? Ayer, Asher, Ayer. Or mm-hmm. um, and that- tell, tell them some, like, um, it, it was something like, I will be sent me here. It was something like that. I'm not sure. That's right. Be- That's right. That's right. That's right. Ayer, Asher, Ayer um, means I will be what I will to be. Very good. Very, very good. Um, All right. It is, it is not... I am what I am is, yeah. That's right. It's not I am, but I am. It's, it's what is it? I will be what I will to be. That's right. That is right. Yahweh will be whatever he will to be. That's right. And then, um, who did Yahweh himself as a cloud? That's right. That's why he symbolizes himself as a cloud. Clouds can be Very good. That is right, baby. Oh, my goodness. That's right. Goodness gracious, that's right. Y'all are doing so awesome. Very good. Yay. All right. Anything else you can think of? Mm. Nope. Okay, perfect. Very good. All right, who wants to go next? Amir, Allison, Q, Paige, Jaden, Jatavius, Javier. 
Oh no, Jarvie is already off. Never mind. Who wants to go next? I'll go ahead and go. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Exodus starts with um, the children of Israel coming down into Egypt and with 70 souls. And Joseph died and the brethren in that generation. But the children of Israel start to increase and grow and grow. And it got to a point where there was a bunch of them. And there arose, and then there was a new king um, uh, that, that was over Egypt. And he didn't know Joseph. And he saw how there was more Egyptians than there, there were than there were Hebrew. And that worry that troubled him because he started conspiring with he started talking to his his um his servants and saying, you know, if they if there's more, I mean if they um join into our enemies and uh they can overtake us. So he sent taskmasters out to afflict the children of Israel and to make their life more better, to keep them low. Um, so they won't try to revolt or do anything like that. And, um, uh, because, and because of that, they grew even more and multiplied even more. So he, um, sent out, um, a decree to kill, uh, children of uh, two and under, I believe, uh, if it was a male to kill them. And if it was a female to, uh, to keep them alive and it was two women, Shippora and Pua, and they were maid servants, and he went, and Pharaoh went to them and told, uh, told the uh, servants, you know, when you deliver air to the Hebrew women, if it's a child, a male child, kill it. And they was like, no, we not like the Hebrew, uh, we not like the Hebrew, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to hand myself. They didn't do it, and then when he came, he called them again, and he asked them, why they didn't do it, and he and they said because we're not like the Egyptians, uh, they are active, and um, mm -hmm. um, and then Moses was I mean so then he went ahead and sent a decree out to a uh, kill, um, to go out and kill all the male children in Egypt. Moses at that time was born in that death decree, and when Moses was born. His mother and his father, which was both, excuse me, which was both um, from the Levi from the Levi tribe. Um, one, so. I'm sorry. Um, so um, Moses' mother and um, and uh, father was from the Levi tribe. She made an ark of bulrushes and hid him in the ark and hit him in the flat, uh, river's brink, brink. When that happened, Moses' sister stayed to see what was gonna happen to him. And the maid servants came down, um, Pharaoh's daughter and, his, and her maid servants came down to, the, to wash themselves. She saw the baby, she saw, I mean, she saw the ark, told the maid to go fetch it, the maid bring it to her and see that it's a child. She knew it was uh, Hebrew because the child had been circumcised and she and Yahweh gave her compassion on that child. And when she pulled him from the ark, she named him Moses. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself again. When she uh, pulled him out of the ark, Moses' sister came and asked if she wanted to uh, send someone to take care of the child. And the uh, Egyptian agreed. Um, and she went to go get his mother, their mother. And then Mo, uh, Pharaoh's daughter paid Moses' mother to raise him up uh, up to age so that she can therefore bring him back onto uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And um, he called, she named him Moses. He grew up uh, later in life under the house, of, uh, the house of the daughter of Moses. And, uh, <laughs> and <It's okay. laughs> I'm sorry. And um, 
one day he was out and he saw an Egyptian uh, smiting a Hebrew. And he looked to the left, he looked to the right. When he didn't see nobody, he killed the Egyptian. He buried him in the sand. And then the next day, when he came out, he seen two, he seen two uh, uh, Hebrews brethren fighting against each uh, amongst each other. And he, when it, you know, was trying to intervene, trying to break it up. And then the Hebrew said, who made you rule and judge over us? Are you going to kill us like you did the Egyptians? So when the Hebrew said that, when the brethren said that, he, he knew it was known. So he knew that Pharaoh was going to be after him, trying to kill him. So he left up out of Egypt. And when he left out of Egypt, he went um, to um, a place in Midian, and it was a, a well where the uh, Jethro, his daughters, were watering the flock. And um, some shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses came and intervened and helped uh, to stop them. And then they end up going back to the house early, back to Jethro's, to their father's house. And then their father is like, well, I, why y'all back so early? He questioned and confused. And then they explained, well, this guy, this Egyptian Moses, uh, came in and saved us from these shepherds. Um, and he said, well, where is he? Uh, bring him in. And they um, ate and subbed, and um, Jethro gave Moses his eldest daughter, uh, Zipporah, and they had a son, Gershom. And Gershom, because um, uh, he was a stranger in a strange land. And that's why he named the child Gershom. And uh, one day, some years has gone by, 40 years have gone by, and one day he uh, took the, he uh, it's a shepherd by then, he took the flock around the backside of a mountain, um, I believe it was Horeb, uh, mountain of Elohim, and he saw a bush, and it was burnt, it was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. And Moses said, I would turn aside to see this great sight. So he, you know, he's seen this bush that's on fire, but not consumed, so he's about to go and investigate. And when he sees... And when he sees, Yahweh speaks to him through, from the bush and says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And Yahweh introduced himself and said, I'm the Elohim of your fathers, Elohim of I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, I've come, down to deliver, uh, I've come down to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. He heard their cry and seen their affliction. And... He told him his name, Moses, his name. Moses was the first person to know the name Yahweh. And he said, Aya, Asha, Aya, I will be what I will to be. Thus thou shalt say to the children of Israel. And Moses started, Moses started coming up with excuses. He started saying, well, I got a speech problem. With, with this, I'm not eloquent. Or you find somebody else. And then I started angering Yahweh. He said, look, don't I make the blind? Don't I make the dumb? Who, who made man's mouth? So he told um, so he told Aaron, he said, um, uh, oh, I can't quote it. He, Five minutes anyway. Pause, pause, pause. Thank you. Said, <laughs> I showed, I showed him once you stop, sugar. You showed on the road. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right, who wants to go next? Alex or Jaden or Paige? Some Tavis to Allison. Anybody want to give it a go? And if you don't get it in order, that's fine. Talk about what you do remember out of what you read, 1 through 32. Even if it's not in order. Who wants to go first between Alex Page, Jaden, Jantavis, Q, Allison? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What about you, oh. Okay, go ahead, somebody. Just did. Okay, Jaden, go ahead. All right. Um. Um. This is this is as much as I can remember. Um. So. When um okay, when Moses killed the uh, Hebrew Egyptian, Moses looked um okay, Moses looked both ways and stuff, and he killed the Egyptian, buried it in the sands. After that, two Hebrews was arguing, and they said um oh J Moses um joined in 
and said, what was it? What was it? Oh, what is it? That did wrong, uh, wherefore smiteth thee, fellow, and got, and uh, the two Hebrews got mad and told Moses that, um, are you going to kill us as you did the Egyptian from yesterday? And Moses was scared, ran off and ran off um, because Pharaoh sought to kill Moses. And But he dwelled in uh, Midian and sat by the well. And the priests um, of Midian had seven daughters and they drew water from, from um, their father's flock. And shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stayed and watered the flock for them. And the daughters told their father about Moses and, um, and what he did. And, pre and the priest wanted to know where he was so he can come over and eat bread. And Moses dwelled, um, and Moses, um, dwelled with the man, and, um, and they did eat. And he gave Moses one of his da daughters, um, Zephyrah, and they had a son and named him uh, Gershom. And Moses said um, he was a stranger in a strange land. And it came to pass that the king, the recent king of Egypt, Egypt that wanted to kill Moses had died. And there is a new king. Then the children of Israel um, sighed by reason of uh, bondage, and Elohim heard their cries and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Elohim looked upon the children of Israel and uh, cognizant them. Um, Moses kept the flock of Jethro. Um, wait, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock back to to the desert and went to the mountain Elohim, even to Horeb, and the angel of Yahweh. The angel of Yahweh appeared unto Moses in the flame of a bush. When staring at the bush, the bush wasn't consumed by the fire. And Moses saw that. And he also said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush does not, doesn't burn. And Yahweh uh, saw that he turned away and uh, Yahweh called unto him. And Moses uh, uh, turned back around, turned back around. And Yahweh said, here, here I am. Where is it? Here am I, draw not thy hither, uh, put off thy shoes, wherein you standing is on is a uh, holy ground. Moreover, Moses is, is Mo, moreover Moses is faced because he was afraid to look upon Elohim, so he so basically he looked away. Um, and Yahweh said, uh, I have surely seen my affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cries by their taxmasters, and he was going to come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them to the land flowing with milk and honey, unto the Canaanites, Hizzites, Amorites, Perizzites, and Jebusites. And he said, the Egyptians oppressed the children of Israel, and he will send Moses to talk to Pharaoh so he can bring his people, which is his children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said, who am I that I should go unto uh, Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? They all responded back saying, I will, I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent he was sent thee that has bring forth the people out of Egypt. Ye shall serve Elohim upon this mountain. Then Moses responded back saying, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and, and shall say unto them, Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, which, what is his name? What shall I say then? Elohim responded back to Moses saying, Ea Asher Ea. Thus shall say unto the children of Israel, I will, I will be half sent to you. Then um, Moses came to, um, came, went to Egypt, talked to Pharaoh. Oh, he, Moses said, not Moses, Yahweh said, um, he will harden Pharaoh's heart and not give, um, and not let the children of Israel go. But he wanted to, I feel like he wanted Moses to see that the, how powerful Yahweh is. That's why he, that's why he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, mm -hmm. during during that time and um he went to egypt told uh told pharaoh to you know well talk to pharaoh then um you know elham has sent me to um let you to like to let the children of israel go um what was it pharaoh basically refused not to let them go and i'm pretty sure that's where the first plague um took place and I forgot what the first plague was, though. I think it was like some mm -hmm. some locusts, but um, I don't no. know for sure. Mm -hmm. it, well, he turned the water into blood. Okay, that's uh, good. That's yeah. fine. It's very, very good, though. I'm very, that's awesome. Very good. Um, anybody else? 
Um, when we're at the end of class anyway, so um, don't worry about it. But let me make this clear because none of y'all said this part. All y'all were saying the same thing. I'm gonna make this clear. At the burning bush, I mean, every last one of y'all. <clears throat> at the burning bush, when Moses asked Yahweh for a name, Yahweh said, "Aya Asha Aya," or "Aya Asha Aya." I will be what I will to be. Has sent me unto you. The, oh. Who thinks that that's a name? Who who thinks that that's a name? Does anybody know? Is A or Asha A or I Asha I a name? No. Mm-mm. No, it's not. It's not a name. That it was a title, but he was just he was actually telling Moses who he was, how he was, explaining to Moses how he was. A or Asha A is not a name, and he demonstrated. Aya Asha Aya or Aya Asha Aya by showing him those three signs, showing that he will be whatever he will to be. But he said, moreover unto Moses, Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have sent me unto you. Yahweh, this is my name forever, and Yahweh is how I will be remembered unto all generations. Yahweh, this is my name is very important. All y'all skipped over the name of Yahweh for some reason, but <laughs> that is, that's the most important, the most important verses in the whole Bible. He said, Yahweh is my name. This is my name forever. And this is how I'll be remembered unto all generations by the name of Yahweh. So that's very, very important. I have several different questions to ask y'all. So what I'll do, I'm going to send y'all questions the way I used to. They won't be in any type of order at all, but I do want y'all to have these questions answered. So next week, when I ask these different questions, y'all will be able to answer them just like that, just like that, just like that. You're going to call each other, um, you know, video chat with each other so you guys can kind of help each other out with the questions. That's cool. If y'all want to get your parents to help you out, that's cool. But I'll send questions out. It won't be today. It'll probably be sometime tomorrow when I send the questions out for y'all to get answered. Will that help? Because um, I want y'all to go back and get with Exodus 1 through 34. Um, cause I, I, y'all have to watch the floor with the adults and I don't want y'all to ever feel fear, especially when we're in this setting. Don't feel shame. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel fearful. Oh, I don't know what to say. Oh, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to say anything wrong. I don't want, this is the part where we're growing. This is a learning experience for us. This is for us to exercise and to grow. Scared of what? Afraid of who? This, we're here to help each other. We're learning about Yahweh. And so when you exercise yourself, the more you exercise, the more you grow. So if you do say something that's wrong, this is the best time to say something wrong so it can be corrected so you'll know the truth about it moving forward. So don't be scared to exercise or to do these different exercises that we're doing. This is how you grow. Okay? Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shamed. Don't be any of those. Don't let any of those thoughts come in because the only one that's trying to make you fear or be afraid to express what Yahweh is showing you is the adversary, because the Holy Spirit's not going to want you to keep it in. The Holy Spirit wants you to share it. Don't put your light on the bushel, shine and show your light, you know, so this is a learning experience for all of us. And even if you don't know it in order, just tell what you share what you do know. Yahweh gives you a testimony. He gives everybody a testimony to share what you do know. And I know some of y'all probably got noisy backgrounds and couldn't share, and that's no big deal, no problem either, but I just don't want it, because you have the adults, some of the adults are feeling the same way on a Thursday night. And so I don't want any, if you guys have been feeling that way, I don't want you to feel that way because this is the perfect place to be like that, you know, to share and to mess up and say something wrong or say something right or whatever. We, we're here to help each other. So we're learning and growing. Y'all did an awesome job. Um, so next week, I want you guys to be familiar with the tabernacle pattern um, compared to the physical body and then have the questions answered that I send out to you guys um, as well. So we kind of start getting ready for the the battle that y'all gonna have in two weeks with the adults okay y'all good when is y'all it again it? the battle the battle versus us and the adults well, y'all, y- y'all got two weeks to prepare two it won't weeks. be next week two, y'all got two weeks to prepare yep okay and so i'll send y'all questions so y'all can get familiar with the you know with the answers all over again so when y'all battle against it because the adults they're going to be fresh with it because they're just now reading what y'all already read a long time ago so y'all need to just be refreshed on it okay okay so we're going to start with exodus the first chapter to the 34th chapter i'll have questions in all of those different chapters um so i'll send those out tomorrow and then i'll send y'all some more questions out next week so be familiar with the physical body 
um, and the tabernacle pattern and have the questions answered for next week. Okay. All right. Who wants to do the doxology? Who wants to do doxology? Anybody? All right. Huh? I don't really know anything about that one. You don't know the doxology? Not really. Not okay. really. I'll do it. Okay. The doc this is the doxology right here, Preston. The doxology is just what we say. Um, and I know you haven't been in the class setting, so you're not really you don't know what the doxology is, but it's just um and then when we first start class, we do the moderation and give prayer. And at the end of class, we do something called the doxology. And it's the last two verses of the book of Jude in the Bible. And this is this is what we say at the end of each class every time. So this is what the doxology is. And so um this is it on the screen here. So if you want to learn it, it's the last two verses of the book of Jude. I'm sure you can ask your mama to help you. She'll help you with the doxology, but um, okay, Amir, you can do it for us. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion, and power both before times now and forever let us all say hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah.